Hello, you beautiful humans. It's Alice, and today I want to discuss something that's been on my mind for a while now. And after some events in my personal life over the past few weeks, it really felt like the perfect time to open up and candidly discuss what life is like for me as an autistic person in neurotypical society. Before we get into it though, if you want to see more content like this, be sure to hit the subscribe button, hit like because it does help with the algorithm, and ring the bell to be notified when new videos drop. When I was in elementary school, I think it has been a while. I was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, which has now been brought under the autism umbrella and is simply referred to as ASD or Autism Spectrum Disorder. Common signs that someone may have ASD include very stiff, repetitive behaviors, thoughts or language, stimming, which is a repetitive movement of certain body parts, a difficulty in empathizing and or understanding facial expressions, body and nonverbal language, or even being able to communicate themselves, a tendency to be easily overstimulated due to outside sensory stimuli, understanding things on a very literal level, and struggling with more abstract or sarcastic humor, having difficulty with interpersonal relationships, and so on. Now, it should be emphasized that no two autistic people's experiences are alike. Every one of us in the community have a vast spectrum of experiences, and not everyone struggles with the more commonly known and unfortunately often stereotyped symptoms. I also tend to avoid using terms like high-functioning and low-functioning, which were coined by psychiatrist Lorna Wing, because those terms are rooted not only in eugenics due to society seeing those who are less able to communicate and engage in any sort of complex tasks as less worthy of life, but are also weaponized by our ableist capitalist economy because they do not believe we can function in the capitalist machine. Therefore, to our corporate overlords, we are not worthy of employment, financial aid, or mental health support. When those are some of the things we tend to struggle more with, Fancy that. My everyday experiences as an autistic trans woman who's still figuring out where I fit into society are fascinating. Earlier in the year, I made a decision to use 2021 to begin the process of unmasking myself and not only come to a more intimate understanding of my own autism, but also learning how to be more comfortable around others while allowing certain things to be a bit more visible. My childhood therapists were the first people who introduced terms like stimming and echolalia to me and helped me become aware of the gulf that existed between the way my mind processes information and the way those around me process information. But they also taught me that certain behaviors had to be masked in order for me to be a functional member of society. Because I was only around 10 or so at the time, it didn't entirely make sense why some of these behaviors were something to hide. But it was the first time I remember feeling a sense of shame and intense self-consciousness over things that were completely natural and often unconscious for me. For example, I would often stretch my neck, repeatedly raise my eyebrows, vocalize sounds like Mm, because let's be honest, that is really satisfying. Roll my eyes or make small repetitive motions with certain parts of my body. And these were things I did from my earliest memories until then. But the way these therapists seemed to view it as something to hide for your own protection made more sense when it hit me that nine times out of 10, boys in school would physically or verbally bully me because they saw my awkwardness and unusual in their eyes, behavior as a target and a sign of an individual less able to defend themselves. That was nearly two decades ago. My understanding of myself and relationship with my neurodivergence now is so, so vastly different from what it used to be. Probably the most immediate and prominent way that my autism influences me is that I see and feel a deep sense of wonder over just about everything. Music, nature, the clouds, art, gratitude, emotions, love, all of it is rich, soul-filling, and something I find great beauty in every single day. It's a very youthful sense of positivity and excited curiosity that's one of the reasons so many of my friends assumed I was five or so years younger than I actually am. Taking care of your skin also helps. Drink your water, kids. My imagination is also very, 
very active since I catch myself daydreaming all the time. Like, I love imagining scenes of myself in some fictional setting, playing a character and putting together a story as I go, or watching planes fly by at night and imagining their spaceships or drones surveying the surface. There's always something happening up there, and it often overlaps with some of my ADHD symptoms, which I'll get to in a bit. But my mind is its own world that is as real and as present as reality itself. Even the mundane things seem interesting to me, and it's like there's this boundless hunger to learn and understand all I can about the world around me. And it's all filtered through this sense of idealism and hopefulness that has time and time again been the very thing that prevented me from committing suicide in 10th grade and last year and saved my life. It's allowed me to experience a profound level of synonymity with and reverence for the world around me. And I realize that kind of sounds like what someone experiences while high or on a psychedelic, but that is very much my default mindset and worldview. Because that interest for whatever it is my mind hungered for was so intense when I was younger, it wouldn't take much for me to get sucked into reading for hours and hours, taking all the time to learn about my newest special interest, and hyper-focusing since, to me, that thing was my world. As I've gotten older, it's become more integrated into my daily life, and new interests don't wholly consume me the way they used to. But that same passion is still there. One of the biggest misconceptions about autistic people is that we can't feel empathy and are very robotic in nature. Thankfully, because of the advocacy of groups like the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, the idea is finally being dispelled. Just speaking for myself, emotions cause the most intense sensory reaction for me, to the point where my entire body will be tingling from love or excitement, and the emotions being presented in whatever type of media I'm watching or listening to will sometimes nearly overwhelm me. Reminder, some of us can perfectly read body language and facial expressions, read between the lines with no issue, and understand sarcasm completely and be equally good at using it. And the same goes for feeling whatever it is those around us are feeling. My partner and a few close friends have mentioned that my ability to see and understand what's happening in their heads is quite disarming. And I think it's because pattern recognition is something that over the years I've realized I'm pretty good at, and I understand people, especially those closest to me on an intimate level, and can connect the dots between different things they're struggling with to help them see the bigger picture. Which again, goes completely against the common narrative that there's an impenetrable barrier between autistic and non-autistic people, and that our ability to understand the inner workings of those around us, let alone our own inner workings, is greatly diminished. There is absolutely no truth to that. Just speaking from my own experiences, I do understand human behavior on a fairly intimate level and don't feel as if I'm out of place or operating on a completely different operating system than everyone else. Psychology is incredibly fascinating to me because not only does it help me understand myself more, but it allows me to peer into the neurotypical minds more clearly. All of this being said, however, with every positive experience that autism brings into my life, an equal amount of struggles are also part of my daily experience. And arguably, my biggest Achilles heel is never really knowing how I'm coming across to whomever I'm talking to, and struggling to express myself in a way that neurotypical people will immediately understand. Because the social customs of neurotypical people do not make a bit of sense to me. Oh my goodness. Friends of mine have mentioned that even though they know I'm coming from a good place and have nothing but love for them, it sometimes feels like I'm centering the conversation too much on myself, or it don't seem interesting interested in how they're doing. Which, none of that is true. It's just that I've never really figured out how to get to know others. I do struggle with relationships that are more platonic than romantic, and freeze up when it comes time to just ask someone to tell me more about themselves. Granted, I'm sure most people wouldn't mind gushing about themselves for a bit, but the idea of asking first before telling feels really backwards to me, even though I can't really explain why. Brains! What even are they? This is the one instance where it does feel like there's a barrier between myself and others, but it's more that I want to reach out, but haven't found a way to do so yet that's comfortable. Speaking of comfortable, textures. Textures, textures, textures. They are 
everything. And I cannot focus on anything else if there's something with an off-putting texture on my body or in my mouth. LOL. If you know what it's like to be overwhelmed by anxiety, imagine every single alarm in your head blaring at once and you being rendered unable to function because all you can focus on is that one uncomfortable sensation and the only thing that will make all of it stop is to jettison whatever is causing that sensation into the stratosphere forever. All of your senses and cognitive functions are completely overwhelmed and being overwhelmed is a feeling I'm all too familiar with. This is where day-to-day -day life becomes incredibly difficult for me, and it's only within the past few weeks that I've come to understand the full extent of how my sensory sensitivities tie into my anxiety and ADHD. It only takes the smallest trigger to kick my anxiety into high gear, and once I'm revved up, I start hyper-focusing on those feelings and will immediately begin pacing, stemming, and panicking to find some satisfying something that can calm me down until I either melt down or completely shut down. Retail is one of the worst environments for me to be in because as I mentioned in a collab video I did with the lovely Mika aka Ponderful, which I will link up here, capitalism, American society, and retail were built specifically for and by neurotypical people. And all those who find themselves within the system will be forced to perform to the standards of their neurotypical masters. The most obvious problem being that if you're neurodiverse, it's quite literally impossible to maintain the same standards that come effortlessly to most neurotypical people because we do not have the spoons or mental capacity for it. We're not wired for it. And the moment I have to look a guest in the eyes at work, it's like my soul just tries to crawl out of my body. Having to walk up to a complete stranger who's shopping and ask if they need help is one of the most alien, uncomfortable experiences I've ever had, as if I'm being forced to do things that are not only wildly unnatural for me, but are the last thing in the world I would ever want to do. It's not that I don't like people, but why? <laughs> It doesn't help when you witness managers going after other employees for not acting neurotypical enough, if you know what I mean. And I end up being stressed the moment I walk in because there's no way of knowing if I'll be called out for doing something that is either unconscious or feels like the normal thing to do. When it comes to my personal life instead of my work life, constructive criticism is absolute hell for me. Even though I appreciate every bit that those around me are willing to give, it is incredibly difficult for me to listen to and accept it without having a meltdown, and it's equally difficult to keep from guilting myself for something that's just a part of the human experience. Having the ability to keep myself level and together and keep my entire body from shaking uncontrollably would be a godsend, but I still wouldn't take being autistic back for the world. There's also a disconnect for me between actions and consequences. When I was still but a wee high schooler, I had a few health scares that I didn't talk to my parents about for months because... It's like my brain draws a complete blank when I'm considering the outcome of any particular decision, which does make decision making a real task for me. And when my executive function kicks down the door and brings the house down, forget about doing anything. The one experience of mine that's incredibly hard to describe, but is apparently more common than I realize, is that I've always felt partially disconnected from reality, as if my body is trapped in a bubble that's separated from the world around me just enough that I notice it, but not enough to make it feel as if I'm not in control of myself. Existence itself feels a bit hazy, and I'll sometimes have this realization that, yes, I am a living, breathing human being and immediately freak out because the sensation of being that connected to my body is just too much for me to handle. On the other hand, this is where my aforementioned vivid imagination comes from. Because my head is always in the clouds, it takes very little to fly away. With every vivid daydream comes a clash of colors, feelings, and expressions, and there isn't a day that goes by that neurotypical society doesn't clash with my neurodivergent mind. We are of two completely different worlds, but the world that I currently live in is one they've claimed sole possession of, and the world that people like myself need does not exist yet. But I fully believe that with more awareness, education, and voices like mine and others, more acceptance within society and criticisms of the structure that gave birth to ableism and locked us out 
will come to pass. Believe you me, I could go on for hours about autistic life, but I'm not going to do that to any of you, so we will wrap things up here. If there are any autism-related topics or questions you would like to see me cover, please leave them in the comments below. That also helps the algorithm, please and thank you. And until the next video, you're amazing, you're beautiful, don't ever forget it. Fucking Christ.